Hi. So my, my presentation is going to be quite simple uh, and uh, fairly short, so we have enough time for questions. I get asked a lot by people about uh, how they should use Steam Spy, and there is no proper way to use Steam Spy. So I'll just guide you, guide you through the some scenarios that I use Steam uh, Spy. Uh, you know, and obviously my user case is might be quite different from yours. So I developed Steam Spy also worked as marketing analyst for quite some time in a number of big companies. And I'm currently an employee of Epic Games, but here I'm just as a Steam Spy. And all the data you, you'll find here, well, most of the data you find here is coming from Steam Spy, and it's available, so you can just go and uh, check it. I want to start with explaining how Steam Spy operates, because it's, it's kind of important to understand, uh, for, to, to understand all its limits and uh, all the usage scenarios. So it, it's based on uh, estimating open uh, user profiles. It basically scans through a random sample of 1.6 million uh, Steam profiles out of 320 million profiles, so less than a half percent of them. And uh, assembles the data, does uh, quite simple calculations, and uh, extrapolates, including the margin of error, and displays it on the, on the website where people can use it. So it, it turned out to be quite a beast by now. It, it's it's kind of big. So it's 48,000 uh, uh, users. Most of them use web, the website weekly. Uh, 42 gigabytes of data on my servers. Almost a million profiles used for estimates. Yeah, so a, a lot of data. And uh, I, I do upgrade servers like every half a year. And I'm, I'm starting to run a like, technical industry and uh, overall engineering cannot <laughs> you know, can, cannot ca keep up with the uh, pace of Steam Pi, Spy growth, so I, I might have to actually optimize my algorithms at some point, uh, but not so far. So, obviously, as you've heard, Steam Spy is lying a lot, and uh, that's because people do not understand uh, the difference between statistics and, and absolute truth. Uh, and I'll, let's start with a simple example of like Steam Spy situation. We have not 300 million people, we have 300 people in a room, and we'll just ask a random sample of 30 people uh, about how many do, of them own the game. And you get the answers, like 20 Dota players, nine CSGO players, one person owns Evolve. Now, how would you imagine how many people actually, of the overall population of those 300 people that are in the room, own those games in total? And there is actually really simple, but wrong answer to this. Just multiply. So 200 Dota players, 90 CSGO players, and so on. The problem with this approach is obviously that we only asked 30 people, and we only got answers from 20 about Dota. So the actual answer is most definitely not 200. It might be close to 200, but most definitely it's not exactly 200. And then when we have to take into account both margin of error and the confidence. Those are quite simple con concepts, if you understand. The confidence basically is a probability of the number landing up in the brackets that we specified. So if you, if you look at the number at Steam Spy displays, like 1,000 plus minus 500, it's displayed with a confidence of 98%. So it means that 98% with give or take of games are going to be in uh, Steam Spy designated brackets. If you want 100% confidence, the answer is going to be like looking like this. So that's 100% confidence. We are quite sure that 10 people out of 300 do not own Dota 2. Everyone else could technically own Dota 2. That's your 100% confidence. But it's, it's kind of not useful, right? Because when your margin of error is so big, it just doesn't make any sense. It doesn't work as, uh, as a good estimate. So we have to go with 98% confidence. And I use 98% confidence in Steam Spy in most uh, political uh, uh, surveys or in most social surveys, people actually use 90 to 96 percent confidence, because it's well they ask less questions than I do because I have to ask ask uh, users about uh, over 15,000 games they own, so it's it's harder than asking about three politicians or you know five political parties. And obviously, as you can see on this example, as small as the sample size, the biggest margin of error relative. To the, uh, to the sample. So for example, for Evolve, our numbers could be 10 plus minus 18, which is, you know, the margin of error is actually bigger than the actual uh, estimate. 
And it happens on SteamSpy as well for, for smaller titles. Usually I say that uh, anything below 30,000 is quite unreliable. Then we have early starts, and people on forums and Reddit and NeoGov usually love those early starts. Like Conan Exiles launched uh, last week, and people started making wild assumptions about Conan Exiles the moment it launched, because the moment the game launches, some starts are available on Steam Spy. But unfortunately, they are usually inaccurate, because for some reason, I'm still baffled by that, but Americans do not launch, launch games at midnight by German time. I, I, I talked to Valve, I said, like, it would be easy for everyone to just launch everything by midnight in, in Berlin, but they don't agree, so they launch games at random times. It's, there is no set time that, you know, I could adjust my algorithms. At some time during the day, the game launches, so I only have a partial sample of, this, of the data for this particular game, and I do need a, a sample for one day for a big margin of error and for three days for kind of the information I usually display. Usually it leads to a margin of error that is not fixed until three full days pass. So if you see any game on Steam Spy, any data for a game on Steam Spy that just launched, it is, it's not probably inaccurate, it's definitely inaccurate, just completely inaccurate, because it's only data from a partial sample. <coughs> uh, the margin of error is super important. The number is most definitely, is not the number in the middle. The number is somewhere on this range. If you, I, I won't say if you learn quantum physics, but I mean it's even harder than statistics. Uh, you can understand the concept that the number is somewhere there, but we cannot be sure because our precision for uh, statistical surveys is not good enough. If we could ask every single player, then maybe our precision would be good enough, but then again, not precisely because people tend to buy games even after you, you ask them about something. And there's a big chance, 2% chance, that the number is going to be outside of those brackets. And the chance is actually bigger because a lot of games uh, have less than 30,000 copies, so the margin of errors are quite wild, and uh, the data is quite inaccurate. And when I'm talking about 30,000, it's, it's an arbitrary number I chose because I, I saw that below 30,000, the uh, uh, number of games that have the data wrong is increases tenfold. But overall, every sample size that has less than 30,000 people, like players are less than 30,000, is inaccurate as well. So. If the game has 30,000 owners, but less than 30,000 people played in the last two weeks, the number for players probably is inaccurate. Highly probable. And uh, it even worse for geographical data. I won't go into the details, but I use a different sampling size for geographical data because a lot of users on Steam Spy don't have the geo profiles filled out. So I, I need a bigger sample. It's usually seven day sample. So yeah. So uh, geographical data for new games is not accurate until the full week passes. So now a little bit about using it, and, and I'll, I'll just go through a couple of examples, but let's, let's start with how people are using it right now. So the first one is actually my preferred uh, usage pattern, is coming up with ideas for new games or checking if something is worth doing so. Like you want to check if you know, people in Poland actually are buying survival craft games, so you want to understand if it's worth investing ten, twenty thousand dollars into localization. And uh, people are getting investments. And I, I was surprised actually how often this happens. I just talked to an uh, indie team uh, here in Berlin last week, and they told me they got invested, financed uh, by median board building Brandenburg purely based on the Steam Spy estimate. So I, I'm, I'm kind of happy that it, it helps. Also, the majority of people actually obviously use Steam Spy for uh, forum wars and holy wars and, and stuff like that. That's not intended, it's a side effect. When we come in with an idea, and we, when we come in with uh, trying to come up with uh, research for uh, our game idea, we have to define the idea first. My preferred method, it's, it's one of many, there's like many methods, but this is something I, I prefer personally, is to define your game as a set of theme, core mechanics, and visual style. And uh, core mechanics would be easily explained as tags on uh, Steam Spy. Theme doesn't work as well, although more or less does, Visual style is, well, people do not tag Steam uh, games, unfortunately, as like, except for retro, 3D and 2D, this is it. And obviously, visual style is more diversified than that. It's just more diverse than that. It's just people that are tagging games on Steam do not have any proper artistic education to distinguish between 80s retro and 70s retro and so on. But you as developers obviously should. 
So then uh, defining competitors, and if your game is on Steam, obviously Steam Spy is a good tool here. And competitors are games that are similar to you. So similar themes, similar game mechanics, and uh, similar visual style. The easiest way to use to research them is to use uh, cross-text search. And cross-text search uh, on Steam it works pretty on Steam Spy works pretty simple. You select one tag, you go to related tag, select another one, select another one, and uh, so on and so on until you get a smaller sample of games, manageable sample. So like not 200, but maybe 20 or 30. Uh, the problem with this estimate is you usually get inflated numbers for your addressable audience. Because if a person ever bought one game in your genre, it will show up on Steam Spy. But it doesn't mean that the person that only had one game in survival craft genre, for example, or in a multiplayer FPS genre is going to buy your game because a lot of them, majority of them, are only buying one game in this genre and they're quite happy with it or unhappy and they will never buy another one. So it's, it's an arbitrary rule, but usually what I'm doing is I'm, select, is, is I'm looking into the number of people that bought three or more games. Then you see a more manageable and more realistic number. So this one is an example for survival craft games. And if you remove all the people that only bought one or two games, you get a smaller audience, smaller addressable, still huge, but obviously way smaller than originally. It obviously differs by genre. So like for survival craft games, people often play one or two. If we're looking into puzzle games, people often buy more than three because puzzle games are finite. You know, you can finish, uh, uh, I, I don't know, uh, Secret of Monkey Island and you won't be replaying it, but you cannot finish Conan Exiles or Minecraft. That leads us to another uh, assumption that competitors could be defined both as audience donors and audience detractors. Audience donors are obviously the games that people finish and they want to play something similar, they go to your game, and audience detractors are the games that people never finish or still continue to play, and they will play them instead of your game. So a good example for a survival craft genre, for example, uh, would be uh, DayZ. DayZ, because of uh, some problems with the game development and so on, became an audience donor for a lot of survival craft games, while those survival craft games were audience detractor for each other. And uh, in, it happens more often in multiplayer games that you have audience uh, detractors, while in single player games, more often than not, you have audience donors. But it varies, obviously, by genre. I was doing survival craft uh, uh, for other reasons, so that's why I've stuck with it. Another thing is that, especially in popular genre, you have one or two big games that constitute a big part of your audience. So overall so survival craft games, most people, like not a half, but a lot of them own either Terraria or done stuff together. That's a big chunk of people that just play those two. And there's an intersection, obviously, because games are kind of similar, both survival crafting, so yeah. It happens in every popular genre, and Steam is, uh, is better in this regard than App Store, for example, but it's still a situation where a winner takes all. So you have a number of big games and everything, everyone else is just a small fish in the pond. The most important part of this presentation is that Steam Spy only allows you to research Steam data, and obviously there's more to life than Steam, and there's more to market than Steam, then please use other tools. I have a presentation, I have an article about it, you, you can read it online, where I can go, in, go into depth, but I will address some of it here as well. So, a couple examples. One is simple, and that is one that well, I encountered a lot. The, uh, the other one is less simple, and I hope that the, other, the second example is something that you will be encountering more than I did. So, the first one is straight out, uh, outright straight clone of a popular game. Uh, when I worked uh, for a different company, we got bombarded with offers to publish a game that is basically this, but better, a lot. Like, it was like a basic pitch. We're gonna make a Wall of Tanks, but better. We're gonna make Quake, but better. So let's make Football Manager, but better, because everybody loves football. We are in Germany, and uh, Football Manager ap appears to be doing well. So, kinda makes sense. But when you check uh, Football Manager, and it's easy because we are, we are talking about outright clone, you'll find out that Football Manager audience is people that do not actually play a lot of games. So they own only 12 games on average. That's a small number. And of those 12 games, they own a lot of Football Manager because it is a yearly game. If you look into Football Manager 20, uh, 2017, most of them are coming from previous edition. And if I would add like Football Manager 2014 and 2013, 
you'd see even more people buying the game constantly. So they don't buy the game every year. Well, a lot of them don't buy the game every year because it's still good after a couple of years. But they do buy, they tend to be, tend to be loyal. So football manager is going to be detractor, or audience detractor for our game. Then there is an interesting question of geography. And if you know football and you know football manager, it's not surprising, but football manager users are mostly from Britain. Not from Germany, which is surprising and gives us an interesting advantage. And not so much from France and obviously not from the United States because they consider another game to be named football. So what we've learned here in just a couple of minutes is that the audience is small and super dedicated. They are not gamers in a classical sense. They, they are okay with Steam because it's the easiest way for them to buy Football Manager, but they are not buying anything else in Steam. They're not playing Dota, for example. They're mostly British. And there's going to be Football Manager 2018 because it makes a lot of money, so obviously. It allows us for several options. The easiest one is obviously just, just don't make Football Manager clone which I would advise actually in this case because there's a licensing course, there's another thing that you, you, you want to take in a, into account, but just based on Steam Spy, probably makes sense if we are going with a clone, probably makes sense to not target Britain and target Germany or France, countries that play football a lot but do not play Football Manager. Probably makes sense to think, uh, makes sense to think outside of Steam, maybe your own launcher, maybe a mob mobile platform, because those are not core gamex. So they are less likely to be on Steam. But Football Manager's people are not stupid. They're doing the same already with Football Manager Touch. And releasing the game close to Football Manager will, be, will, uh, will force players to make a hard choice between you and a Football Manager. Because they are probably loyal to Football Manager, they might not choose your game. So it makes sense to separate your game in, in time. But my advice would be not just, just don't make the Football Manager clone. And something unique. and. This is my favorite exercise. I asked people on Twitter to come up with an outrageous idea, and Melanie and Christine came up with atomic game about zombies set in future. I've checked there are no games like this, on Steam at least. That's good for us. So this is something completely unique that every indie is dreaming about. Atomi is a dating game, but with female character. And yeah, so this is a crazy combination that we're looking into it. And it's a female character that's supposed to date zombies and set in the future. So obviously, because it was never done before, and it's a game about female character. Like, nobody's going to play it, right? Nobody's going to pay for it. It's a stupid idea, and yeah, Melanie should be ashamed. But it's actually not. If you look outside of Steam Spy, it's actually not a stupid idea. There's been a movie recently called Warm Bodies that made a lot of money. And it's a movie about a girl dating a zombie in the future. Because zombies are nice guys, deep inside. Uh, yeah. Uh, the data is from Box Office Mojo. I forgot to add an asterisk. So it's, it is pretty accurate. So you can do some research for this genre on Steam Spire. Because there are some Otomi games. The most familiar, famous is Heartful Boy Boyfriend. And there are some games with zombies. And Heartful Boyfriend seems to be doing well. But like, I would say Steam Spire is bad for this. Because if you look, if you look into Otomi, if you look into Heartful Boyfriend and in, in, into genre, we'll see that uh, Hateful Boyfriend is popular with core gamers, which we know shouldn't be true because Otome games are targeted towards female audience, and Steam is not a female, well, not rich with female players. And if you look into uh, addressable audience, you'll see that not many people actually own more than one Otome audience. So they probably bought Hateful Boyfriend for the novelty of it or in a bundle. But if you look outside of Steam and of Steam and at Steam Spy, we'll see that that have been a plenty of zombie romance movies. So Warm Bodies was not an exception. It was a continuation of trend. Uh, Return of the Living Dead, the guy dates a zombie girl. Oh, his girlfriend dies and he dates her. Zombie uh, Pride, Prejudice, and Dobbies actually don't date zombies, but they do date during zombie apocalypse. Uh, zombie Honeymoon, yeah. And Fido is, is a reverse story about a, a girl dating a zombie guy and actually cheating on her husband with a zombie and then killing her husband so he could become a zombie and uh, it's complicated. <laughs> Great movie, by the way, yeah. So, and also, a, a boy owns a zombie and he uses him as a pet, as a dog. So, yeah, a lot of love there to zombies. 
Uh, if you looked into Google Trends, uh, you can see that mm, zombies are less popular now. They, pe they picked around 2013 when uh, Warm Bodies was released, and Warm Bodies was obviously trying to capitalize on The Walking Dead success. So it was not like the Warm, warm, uh, warm Bodies made it uh, the spike. They just used it really smart. And let's look to MDB to see who people who are, who is watching these movies, because probably those people will be buying the game. And apparently, well. Uh, women tend to drag in their boyfriends to these movies. Boys do not like these movies, but girls do. So every single movie that I've checked in this genre is rated higher by young females that, uh, than young males, and obviously uh, than old males. Kind of makes sense if you think about it, because it's a, it is a still a romance story despite having zombies in it. And yeah. For Atomic Games, I, I looked into Wikipedia, I looked into some research. Unfortunately, I couldn't find any statistical data, so it's not reliable, but it seems like those games are popular in Japan because uh, I, I've seen research that indicates that like 25% of revenue in Japan comes from Atomic Games. That's, that's big. And they're popular with female gamers. So, yeah. And what it means for us is that, yeah, we're developing the game for women, and uh, some of them are going to be in Japan, so we should have a Japanese localization. Despite not having any game on Steam Spy, there seems like this, this particular, and it's just an example. You, you, you obviously should research your own game. Don't, don't just rush in and make this game in particular. Uh, it seems like there is an audience for zombie romance games, so zombie atomic games set in the future. Because there have been movies about it, and people went not once, not twice, not three times, but constantly to watch these movies and pay money to watch these movies. There is no competition, which is an awesome thing for us. Uh, but we cannot steal audience from anyone else, which is not so awesome. It's hard to promote a game that is not existent. And it's not like we're going to ride the zombie uh, wave because zombies are going down right now. So I, I believe like vampires should be going up. So maybe let's make a game about dating vampires. And this Steam doesn't seem like a right choice here because uh, there's not many competitors on Steam. So, and not many uh, female gamers on Steam. It gives us a lot of good options here. So no competitions, no, bar, no quality bar. We don't have to go full 3D, we don't have to go full animation, we don't have to hire superstars to voice the game. People will be fine as long as the game is good enough, so it doesn't have to be great. They, they will be comparing the, game, comparing the game to Heart of a Boyfriend, which is a low-tech game, and it gives us uh, uh, more flexibility. We could work with lower budget, with smaller team. The target audience is tricky because it's mostly female, so we need to have female game designers and female producer or somebody who can actually you know, make decisions. And I do believe that men can develop a game for female audience because I've seen some examples, but I do believe that female game designers are usually better in this. So, again, because I saw more examples of successful uh, female-driven game with female producers than the other way around. And because we, don't, we are not sure about Steam. So Steam might be a great choice, but it might be not. We just don't have enough data. We should have a a game that is portable and easily portable to other uh, platforms. So I don't believe I'm saying this, but maybe try default as an engine for this. Uh, something that is easily portable and uh, does not require a lot of resources on any uh, platform. And yeah, we need Japanese localization, obviously. So the summary is, uh, seems like I can be in inaccurate because some stupid mass. Who, who remembers about confidence range by, by now? Oh, some people do. Good. <laughs> uh, my preferred definition of a game for marketing research is sim plus game mechanics plus visual style is the game. Only part of the general audience that you can research in Steam Spy will ever consider buying your game. Most of them will not even think about it. Some of them will, and most of them will not buy it anyway. And. If you have competitors, that can be both a good thing and a bad thing because they can be either audience donors or audience detractors. But being all alone means that you don't have audience donors, which is a scary thing. And if you go to a publisher, for example, and you'll say, we, uh, we have something unique that has no audience donors, that has no competition, they'll be scared shitless because they're afraid, they, because they don't know how to market these kind of games. And it is tricky. As a person working in marketing for the last 20 years, I can say it's super tricky. And please use other tools, except for Steam, uh, not just Steam Spy, when you're uh, researching the market, because yeah, yeah, it's it's just for Steam Spy audience, for Steam audience. 
In, in particular, if you're developing something unique, which I hope you do, look into movies and comic books, because while you can think that your game is unique, a lot of stuff you're, you're trying to do was already done by other people in other media that are probably at least uh, as talented as, as you are. So we actually have some time left for questions, so fire away. Yeah, I just wanted to ask you, um, what are your plans about uh, developing the Steam Spy in general? Do, are you planning to add some like more in-deep integration to, I don't know, other analytics engines or...? or uh, well, I, I'm, I'm trying to, to make it easier for people to use it. So I, I've, uh, just yesterday I reworked the export engine, so it does not require Flash anymore. You can export it even on iPad. And I've added uh, a couple more formats for people to, to export to. I'm trying to come up with a solution to export um, every single graph. Right now, you can export it if you just go into source page, copy paste uh, ch chunk of JSON data, and it obviously not not I'm not doing uh, lots of print screens. Yeah, yeah. So I'm trying to come up with a solution to do this. It, it just uh, because of I recently moved to Berlin and I got a new job. I don't have a lot of time to do this, but yeah, the point is to allow people to do more stuff with Steam Spy, because when I, I do all this like cross-tag research or I do audience research, I see that people rarely use it. People usually prefer to do it their way than my way. So my, my focus is allowing people to e e obtain the information from Steam Spy easier. So extending API, for example, stuff like that. I will add tags to API so people can do cross-referencing themselves without looking into my tools. So you scrape a lot of data off the Steam system. Are you ever throttled, or do you do any tricks to make sure that you're not uh, shut down? Y yes, I'm using uh, several uh, IP addresses for that. I'm checking if I'm not uh, actually going against Steam rules. And Steam doesn't uh, advertise those rules anywhere. But when I asked, I got an answer that they actually have rules about uh, using uh, Steam API. So I'm trying to abide by uh, what they require. Uh, I don't uh, do more than one request uh, at a time at, at the same IP address. And mm -hmm. because Steam API is not exactly the fastest one, I have to use six in a, at the same time mm -hmm. so to obtain information faster. Uh, I could ac actually add more uh, addresses and uh, query more data from Steam, but it comes down to processing the data. And the more data you, you have, the geometrically harder it becomes to pro pro process it. So I, I feel like I'm in a good spot right now, uh, you know, compromise between uh, my ability uh, to process the data in like four hours right now, and uh, having enough precision uh, for it to be actually useful. OK. Well, we've run out of time. Uh, if more questions uh, for Sergey, please sort of uh, talk yeah. to me outside. But a round of applause for a great presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you.